Okay, um, welcome everyone. Um, sorry, I hope um, we can continue the conversation soon, but um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Reggie Jackson, and I'm a professor in the Department of Asian Languages and Cultures here, working on pre-modern Japanese literature and performance. Um, and I am uh, have the honor and pleasure of welcoming you all here for our fifth CGS lecture for the fall of 2023. So, um, before I get to uh, the reason we're here today to hear uh, Dr. Yamada um, give us his lecture, I'd like to make a few um, general announcements first. So, um, please join us one week from now for the next lecture in the fall 2023 CGS Thursday lecture series, The Curious Case of Aoto Fujitsuna, given by Professor Ethan Siegel, Associate Professor of History and Chair of the Japan Council at Michigan State University. This lecture, though previously advertised to be on the 10th floor, will actually be in this room, um, <laughs> Wiser 110, uh, on the first floor instead. So we apologize for this late update, but hope you can uh, join us next week here in this room for Dr. Siegel's lecture. Also, uh, one week from now, uh, on November 9th and 10th, the Digital Studies Institute will be hosting a symposium on esports, video gaming as a spectator sport, through the lens of identity looking at the many ways identity shapes digital games, technologies, and their competitive worlds. I know that many of you are interested um, in the topic, so I hope you can join us. Uh, the panel is going to, on the 9th, will be in the multi-purpose room in the LSA building, and the two panels on the 10th will be in room 1010 of Weiser Hall, so on the 10th floor of this building upstairs. All panels will also be live streamed on Zoom. CGS is a co-sponsor of this symposium, and we hope to see many of you there. Additionally, on November 15th, in the Helmut Stern Auditorium at the University of Michigan Museum of Art, there will be a multimedia presentation titled Asian Futures Without Asians by the artist Astria uh, uh, Superak. It examines 60 years of American science fiction cinema through the lens of Asian appropriation and whitewashing and asks, what does it mean when so many white filmmakers envision futures inflected by Asian culture, but devoid of actual Asian people? As with the symposium, this event will be broadcast via Zoom and is also co-sponsored by CGS. For those of you attendees adjoining via webinar, uh, webcams and microphones have been muted, but we do invite you to use the Q&A function during the lecture to submit any questions you have, and the presenters will try to address as many of these as possible. The live transcription or closed caption function will be enabled, but if you'd rather not have that, just go to the bottom right corner of your screen to disable it. Also then, please check out our CGS events page or various social media for CGS lectures and music performances scheduled in fall of 2023. And with that, I would like to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Keisuke Yamada. So it is my great pleasure this afternoon to introduce our speaker today, Center for Japanese Studies postdoctoral fellow, Dr. Keisuke Yamada. In chairing the selection committee tasked with um, hiring our Center for Japanese Studies postdoctoral fellows, Dr. Yamada and Dr. Stevens Chu, I was impressed by Dr. Yamada's intellectual range, his enthusiasm, and strong publishing profile. Our committee assessed him to be an ambitious scholar whose research contributes much to our understanding of Japanese music and the politics of Asian performance traditions more broadly. Prior to joining us here at CJS, Dr. Yamada served as a Japan Studies postdoctoral fellow at the Asian Studies Center at the University of Pittsburgh. He received his PhD in ethnomusicology from the University of Pennsylvania and his master's music and historical musicology from Northwestern University. His doctoral dissertation, Ecologies of Instrumentality, the Politics and Practice of Sustainable Shamisen Making, received the 2021 Northeastern Association of Graduate Schools Doctoral Dissertation Award in Arts and Humanities. He's also the author of the 33 and a third uh, series book, Supercell, featuring Hatsune Miku from 2017, and has published peer-reviewed work uh, prolifically in a number of scholarly journals, including Asian Music, Ethno Ethnomusicology Forum, Japan Forum, Japanese Studies, Technology and Culture, the Asia Pacific Journal, and uh, forthcoming um, in the new year uh, from the Journal of Japanese Studies. He's also currently completing, completing a book entitled Ecologies of Sound, Noise, Music, and Silencing in Industrial Japan. The book offers a sound-centered analysis of the logic and interplay of global capitalism, militarism, and industrialization that have shaped the soundscapes and sound politics of 20th century and 21st century Japan. The book manuscript is currently under revision for um, with Duke University Press, and we're eagerly anticipating the publication of that volume. 
Also, in collaboration with independent scholar and filmmaker Andrew Nice, uh, Dr. Yamada has been working on another book and film project entitled Noisy Capital, Environmental Music um, and an Aesthetic Labor in the, cap in the Capitalist Scene. In this multimodal work, they argue that the transnational emergence of, quote, factory music and environmental music in factories, offices, and homes was deployed to cope with the cognitive and physical stresses of industrial capitalism from the late 19th century to the present. Additionally, one contribution of the book is that it offers a transnational genealogy of gendered aesthetic labor in early Japanese factories. Beyond this, Dr. Yamada is also conducting research on a new book that explores links between deaf studies and psychology as the basis for the emergence of discourses on sound in modern Japan. So he has a really um, incredibly wide berth, um, and this is one of the things that thinks, um, we can all learn from. Dr. Yamada is also an accomplished teacher, having taught a range of courses over the past several years. This includes the course Introduction to Music and World Cultures in 2019, which covered various musical traditions in various parts of the world, where he covered um, different environmental issues that surround local musical practices and in musical instrument making, incorporating perspectives of cultural preservationists, animal rights activists, environmental con conservationists, and ecologists into class discussions. He's furthermore has taught the course Jazz History and Style, which focused particularly on the issue of racism and the racial dynamics of the time that made American jazz um, uh, during the development of American jazz in the United States. He's also an accomplished jazz guitarist, which personally makes me happy as well. Um, I first learned of Keisuke's work in conducting research for a book on performance and slavery in pre-modern Japan. And in that context, I happened upon his wonderful article from 2019 on the genealogy of Kokujin, critical thinking about the formation of Bangkoku and modern Japanese perceptions of blackness. This article was remarkable for being historically attuned, multidisciplinary in its approach to art historical sources, and pedagogically useful in both undergraduate and graduate course settings. Indeed, several students in the course Anti-Racism anti in Japanese Culture named it as one of their favorite readings over the whole semester, and for good reason. This is all to say that Dr. Yamada possesses a range of skills across fields and regions, and is well worth talking to and learning from. Uh, along with um, our other um, our visiting professor, Toyota professor, um, Dr. Tomizawa Kei, as well as Dr. Stevens Chu, he will also be teaching a course in uh, the winter semester. Um, he'll be teaching Japanese traditional culture and sustainable politics, which delves into some of the most up-to-date research findings and debates on traditional performing arts in the fields of Japanese studies, Asian studies, and Asian American studies. I would highly recommend it to any students interested in gaining a more nuanced, critical perspective on Japanese culture within the context of globalization, environmentalism, and multiculturalism. So in closing, I'd like to reiterate how uh, lucky we are here at CGS to have Dr. Keisuke Yamada joining our intellectual community for the year and sharing his multifaceted expertise with our students and faculty. Today, he'll be presenting a talk entitled, Listening to the Explosive Sound of U.S. Military Aircraft in Wartime Japan. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Keisuke Yamada. Thank you very much, Jackson-sensei. Can everyone hear me, including the... Okay. Uh, okay, I'd like to thank uh, the Center for Japanese Studies staff members, and uh, also Alexis for helping me and set setting up everything. And also I'd like to thank uh, the Stan's Collection of Musical Instruments and the International Institute at the University of Michigan as this talk is part of the Fall 2023 Festival of Asia Music. In June 1944, the city of Kokura, now Kitakyushu, Fukuoka Prefecture suffered a U.S. military airstrike. 14-year-old Okamoto Nobuko was working at the Kokura Army Arsenal as part of high school mobilization efforts when she heard the din of Boeing B-29 Super Fortresses dropping bombs competing with Japanese aircraft guns. As she testified almost 60 years later, in 2009, the sound of bombing signaling the presence of foreign military forces had a traumatic effect. I 
、自分の頭の上に真っ暗の中で、プロペラの音、機関銃がカタカタカタカタっていう音、それから放射砲がドカーンドカーンと飛行機をやっつける音、爆弾を落とす。爆弾を落とす音っていうのはやっぱりすご,すごい音でしたからね。でもね、ああ、これで死ぬのかなと。実際ちょっとで死ぬのかなと思ってね。悲しかったですね。もう悲しい。とにかくもう、時間が経つのがもう一生懸命、早く終わらなかったね。っち感じでしたね。すごいでしょプロペラの音は。プロペラの音すごいんだから。Beyond the clear trauma of war, Okamoto's recollection is striking for its precision in the identifying sound. Even more than half a century after the event. This is neither a coincidence nor an expression of her individual acoustic abilities. Rather, her precise recollection of sound was the product of national training in the 20th century soundscape of the world. In the first half of the 20th century, the development of military technologies significantly shaped the soundscapes of the world. In his 1943 book, 不思議な音の世界 meaning the world of mysterious sounds. 田口龍三郎 an acoustic engineer at the Institute of Physical and Chemical Research, explained that during World War I, aircraft became weapons of aerial assault. 田口 remarked that because, quote, aircraft can fly above the clouds and through the mist and even in the dark. We cannot solely depend on our sight anymore to locate them. End quote. And as countries invented their own anti-aircraft defense weapons, acoustic locators played a key role in monitoring the skies. European countries applied various audio-based war technologies on World War I battlefield. A growing scholarship attests to the rapid spread of audio-based military technologies and acoustic location techniques in Western context. Such research analyzes the development of acoustic locators in Britain, France, Germany, Italy, and the United States around the 1910s. The research represents what Laviv Gantro calls the story of acoustic defense. Which narrates society's audible past in terms of the development of acoustic defense technologies. Although Gantro's case study focuses on Britain's early 20th century acoustic defense project, in particular large scale sound mirrors, as you can see here on the screen, it situates the British example in relation to the much broader formation of contemporaneous listening habits. These histories of technology importantly complement another area of inquiry regarding wartime soundscapes. The modernization of warfare increasingly demanded cultivating listening skills, a process That unfolded on a global scale. This presentation focuses on how the Japanese developed acoustic locators in the 1920s and cultivated ways to optimize these devices and understand the sounds of armed combat. The aim is not just to broaden the global significance of audio based military technologies. From a sound studies and a history of technology perspective, it shows that the impact of these technologies, in fact, extended well beyond the military sector. Japan's use of acoustic, ah,、uh, sorry, Japan's use of audio based war technologies was coupled with an increasingly listening based defense strategy that subjected the public to oral training. Resembling that of military personnel. Various historical actors were involved in the discourse and the practice of oral training in wartime Japan, including government and the military officials, educators, scientists, and the civilians, including school children. 
in Imperial Japan, where elementary schools were renamed National People's Schools in 1941. Their new music curriculum included oral training or onkan kyoiku, and the school children were expected to master perfect pitch or zettai onkan. This change represented a departure from Japan's previous shoka curriculum, school songs mostly based on Western melodies, originally adapted by the Meiji government, 1868 to 1912, as a tool for moral training and cultivating values. The new music program with oral training aimed to not only teach children morals, but also strengthen defense in wartime. Through explosive sound training or bakuon kyoiku, children like Okamoto were encouraged to memorize and identify the various recorded explosive sounds or bakuon of their enemy forces. All that training was considered useful for determining whether enemy forces are approaching from which direction and the, with what type of vehicle, including aircraft, ships, submarines, and so on. When war intensified in the early 1940s, these listening modes were incorporated into the nation's civil defense. Yet in the global history of civilian air defense, few studies have examined its auditory dimensions. The existing literature looks at firefighting aspects, such as how civilians were trained to extinguish fire bombs with pails of water and sand in bucket relays. As another example, uh, Jennifer Weisenfeld analyzed the visual culture of civil defense, particularly the gas mask as an instrument that, quote, increasingly appeared in the public visual sphere in 1930s Japan. End quote. Japanese officials and the military commanders' sense of needing to cultivate children's oral skills as a defense strategy, defense strategy initially came from their witnessing the development of war technologies and the advanced oral skills of the military in Western Europe and elsewhere. Japanese military personnel convinced music educators that listening would be instrumental in competing with other nation states and the imperial powers. At the same time, music educators influenced military personnel by devising oral training programs for school children. Consequently, military academies implemented similar oral training using the piano. The influence was mutual. Exploring this historical intersection of military technology and music education offers a broader understanding of how modern sound politics can overlap with exercising wartime power. So here is the overview of this presentation and it has three sections. One is acoustic, I will talk about acoustic locators and also I will contextualize this in total war, which you are where uh, citizens, civilians were incorporated into a system of war. So this is one. Then two, I will talk about what the school program in, especially from 1941 to 1945. So the shoka is a school song tradition started about like 1870s. Then scholars talked about the, the system. Then focusing, agreeing like it was basically about like moral training. Then what I'm arguing is this is more practical, especially for the context of air defense and the civilian defense. So this, this context of total war, it's more really about practical, yeah, which happened 1941 to 1945. Then the last part is the state failure, uh, force assurance that I talk about the Japanese state's failure about this project. Okay. The first section. In Japan, especially from the 1930s to the end of World War II, acoustic locators were considered important inventions to defend against enemy craft, ships, and submarines. Acoustic locators are technologies that track 
aircraft using various designs that make distant sounds audible to humans. For Western powers, audio-based war technologies had become an important means of defense in World War I. Western nations had invented acoustic defense method to counteract the airplane's emergence as an offensive weapon. American, British, and French method of acoustic location were the most advanced at the time and afforded these allied forces a military advantage. Other methods included Italian sound ranging and the German acoustic defense method, such as underwater submarine detection. Czechoslovakia and Sweden also designed and used acoustic locators in the early 20th century. Japan began to manufacture acoustic locators in the 1920s, a decade or so later than most of the Western countries just mentioned. Japanese de devices included the Type 90 large air sound detector and the Type 90 small air sound detector. Type 90 acoustic locators were called home models, meaning uh, or lapagata. Their design resembled a tuba bell. It had two pairs of horns mounted on a four-wheel carriage. This home model was not unique to the Japanese army. The United States Department of Defense Historical Film Number 1132, published in 1934 and 1935, showcased an almost identical model, which is uh, the one on, you can see on your right. In Japan, Articles on war technologies published in the 1930s features the Type 19 acoustic locator. Early designs in the shape of an exponential curve appeared in the late 1920s. Tentative rules on how to handle acoustic locators on battlefields, including an explanation of military, oper military operatives' roles, were published in 1930. The four horns were typically arranged in pairs, both vertically and horizontally. One operator or auditor specified the altitude of an aircraft, while another operator or auditor specified its azimuth. The acoustic locator relied on what was globally recognized as binaural hearing meaning a general human capacity to hear and locate with two ears, the direction from which uh, sound is coming. Acoustic locators were deployed, especially in the dark, alongside anti-aircraft searchlights and anti-aircraft guns. These machines were installed 40 to 50 kilometers away from city centers. Human auditory perception thus vitally comp compensated for the limitations of visual perce perception in wartime. From the early 1930s, the notion of air defense or voku came into vogue as Japanese officials considered on how to effectively defend against enemy forces equipped with the most advanced war technologies. The acoustic locator, along with anti-aircraft satellites and anti-aircraft guns, was one of the main topics in this defense debate. Looking at the, the notion of air defense as a part of the global history of civil defense, historian Sheldon Garon has noted that while active global air defense in the first half of the 20th century emphasized the use of anti-aircraft guns, fighter planes, and the warning systems. Quote, states also rushed to promote civilian defense, connoting not only the protection of civilians, but also civilians' active participation in their own defense, end quote. In the case of Japan, the first mass air defense drill took place in Osaka in July 1928, followed by others in Nagoya and Mito in 1929. 
In August 19, 1933, military and the civil authorities organized large joint air defense drills in the Kanto region, where civilian practices bucket relays and other firefighting exercises. The air defense law, or Boku Ho, was promulgated in April 1937 and came into effect later that October. Through this law, the state created new legal mechanisms to punish civilians for violating air defense obligations. Following the outbreak of the Second Sino-Japanese War from 1937 to 1945, the Japanese government enacted the National Mobilization Law, or Kokka Sodo Info, prompting, prompting civilians, both men and women, to engage actively in war pro- production, war distri- uh, food distribution and defense. Publications promoting civilian defense instructed the public, even school children, about up-to-date war technologies. For instance, the June 1939 issue of the children's magazine, Shogaku Ichinense, first graders illustrated military maneuvers complete, complete with acoustic locators, anti-aircraft guns, and a military aircraft. The image's caption explained that the acoustic locator enabled one to hear the sound of enemy aircraft. The quickest way to deta- determine whether or not they are approaching. Although Shogaku Ichinense was and still is a magazine aimed at first graders, its language seems highly technical for six and seven years old. So this is the, the Shogaku Ichinense published today, the most up to date issues. Yeah. So. This is the version in 1930s. As another example, the 1941 book, Shonen Boku Dokhon, Boys Textbook on Air Defense, edited by the Home Ministry's Planning Bureau, likewise explained the acoustic locator to its young readers. Also, to consecutive 1938 issues of Kagakuto Moke, Science and Model, which was a popular young people's magazine, even published instructions on how to make a scale model of the acoustic locator. All these sources demonstrate how extensively audio-based war technologies developments were communicated to the general public, even directly addressing young audiences. So this is significant is that they are focusing on really visual aspect rather than the function or technicality. Yeah. Especially targeting the general public. People thus recognize that listening was an important human capacity for defending against enemy forces and served as a practical complement to sight, given that the acoustic locator and the anti-aircraft satellites operated together. In his 1942 book, Tatakao Shinheiki, meaning New War Fighting Technologies, Omori Sanpei argued, quote, in order to cultivate their oral skills and carry out the task of air defense, everyone in the nation needs to first understand the structure and the functioning of the acoustic locator, end quote. In the interwar period, Japanese officials realized that Western European nations audio-based war technologies, along with their military personnel's oral skills, were highly advanced and crucial to civil defense. In the late 1930s and the early 1940s, such awareness spread not only among Japan's military institutions, but also to the education sector. Uh, moving on to the next section. In the early 1930s, pianist and music educator Sonoda Kiyohide developed perfect pitch training for school children, hoping to integrate it into Japan's elementary school curriculum. 
Perfect pitch refers to an individual's ability to hear a single tone and identify its specific frequency on, or pitch by name. For example, the note A above middle C had a frequency of 435 hertz at that time. When Sonoda died, Oida Kokichi embraced Sonoda's mission. A 1936 article in the Asahi Shimbu newspaper explained that Honmachi and Kanatomi Elementary Schools, two elementary schools in Tokyo City, implemented a one-year perfect pitch training program, originally aimed at creating child prodigies. The perfect pitch training program became instrumental as educators believed it would in the movement to eliminate vulgar popular songs, specifically the ryukoka genre, genre, the popular music genre. So this is one example. Asahi, Asahi newspaper is critiquing the, uh, uh, trying, like, uh, Asahi newspaper capturing the, how your music educator is trying to eliminate such vulgar songs and melodies from children's heart. Music educators initially exercised public pitch training as a disciplinary tool for teaching morals to Japanese children. However, oral training soon became part of a broader political defense strategy. After elementary schools became national people's schools in 1941, music education underwent a significant reform. The subject, school songs, or shoka, was replaced with music. Ongaku, and the music became part of the broader arts and the craft course, or Geinoka, which included calligraphy, arts, handicrafts, and sewing. The music course focused on Western harmony and the rhythm rather than melody, as in the former school songs, or Shoka. But the mi Ministry of Education's new two-volume songbook, called Uta no Hon, for first and second graders, represented another major shift in the music curriculum. That is, school children were expected to master perfect pitch. So this is a cover of the Uta no Hon, the volume two, uh, uh, published by the mini Ministry of Education. The instruction edition of Uta no Hon, which is di distinct from this one, that the instruction edition is for teachers. The instruction edition of Uta no Hon highlighted the importance of developing oral skills. Under the revised curriculum, every school child was expected to perceive the rise and the fall of sounds, their relative loudness, and their timbre or tone quality, as well as develop competencies in rhythm and harmony. This oral training adapted the Iroha sequence and the notes of an octave were renamed Iroha ni ohe to written in katakana letters instead of do, re, mi, fa, so, la, si, the notes in the movable do solfege system. At National People's Schools, each class session lasted 14 minutes. And in music classes, children were supposed to spend about 10 minutes on oral training. Importantly, the first volume of the Uta no Hon instruction manual stated that the arts and the crafts course aimed to discipline the nation people, or kokumi. The volume also asserted that, quote, it is important to cultivate a spirit that can contribute to the field of the national defense industry, end quote. A 1942 article in Kikaika, meaning Mechanization, a Journal of National Defense and Technology, features photographs and a description of children taking oral training at the National People's School in the city of Sakai, Osaka Prefecture. 
This oral training used the Western Five Line musical stuff, which a teacher drew on both boards and the paper. A grand piano stood in the classroom after hearing a note that the teacher played on the piano. Children were encouraged to put a small round piece of paper on the corresponding line or space on the musical staff. This training included the children singing in choirs and performing short musicals. So this picture is really, I have, I found only one example capturing how the oral training will look like in photo. According to the article's anonymous author, children generally like music and have a great talent for singing. There is a new kind of music education called public pitch training. By taking this training, each child will develop their ears and become more sensitive and precise about sounds with varying pitches. Such ears will be useful for national defense and contribute to the science industry, end quote. But how and why were such skills thought important and useful for defending the nation? Sato Kendo's 1938 book, Onkan Kyoiku Nitsuite, Zettai Onkan Kyoiku no Shorai, meaning on oral training, the future of perfect pitch training considered the important role that cultivating basic oral skills as part of music education might play in defense, reporting how servicemen in France, Germany, and Italy listened to the sound of armed combat. The book was based on Sato's 1937 lecture at the first perfect pitch training summer course. A music education professional, Sato had worked with Japanese school inspectors and lived in Germany from July 1921 until September 1934, where he learned about European music pedagogy. Based on his experience, experiences, Sato aimed to create a music program that studies Western harmony rather than melody and developed oral skills. Sato wrote of a Japanese military connection who had keenly observed European troops' oral skills. He was a lieutenant colonel and a violinist living in Paris as a member of the International Military Commission. Sato recounted his friend's observations of military maneuvers in France, Germany, and Italy, where he surmised that these troops had advanced oral skills to help them ascertain what type of munitions enemy forces were using and even their location. In France, for instance, military auditors had already received, received daily air training during World War I, and French considered directional listening crucial to becoming a uh, quote unquote good listener. Sato wrote that his friend thought that Japanese citizens and the service members too should develop oral skills, and he believed that music education would play a crucial role. When they met in Japan in January 1937, the lieutenant colonel encouraged Sato to develop comprehensive oral training programs for school children. As another example, Asahi Shinbun articles in 1941 explained the relevance of oral training to the military and the defense industry. One of the articles titled Kodomo Kokumin Gakko Ebanashi 6, 6, I mean, Children, an illustrated story of national people's schools, 6, included a section titled Oral Training. The anonymous author wrote that oral training is, quote, important not only for music listening per se, but it is also relevant to the military industry. A person with excellent oral skills can identify any plane travel 
just by listening to the sound of its propellers, end quote. In another article titled, titled Proper Oral Training During Childhood, the authors asserted that the Japanese in general have poorer hearing than Westerners. According to the authors, every child should receive proper oral training as part of their elementary education for military, industrial, and everyday purposes. Notably, in January 1941, just months before these articles appeared, the Japanese government had begun enforcing the newspaper limited publication ordinance or Shinbun, Shinbun Shi To Keisai Seigen Lei to seize control of the media based on the national mobilization laws, Article 20. Japan's military academies implemented oral training similar to that in national people's schools. A radio program in May 1943 featured daily life at the Military Academy for Heavy Artillery, or Rikugun Juhohei Gakko, in Uraga, Kanagawa Prefecture. Cadets at the Military Academy had to learn techniques such as underwater listening. This technique was instrumental for sensing approaching enemy submarines or ships, especially in the dark or in foggy conditions. The radio program narrated a scene in which students at the military academy were having an oral training lesson. An instructor taught two major triads on the piano, which the students listened to and memorized. The instructor then played these chords at random, and the student collectively identified which chord the instructor played. The radio program presenter emphasized that after completing this part of oral training, students had learned to identify different machine sound. So I have a recording of the, that, about the oral training in the Middle East Academy. So I, I will play. <laughs> では、これで、正和、この人のもの、それぞれ。これ、初め、正義、正和のもの、なかった。それをよく覚えて、次に問題を始めた場合に、確認が、正義の正和のもの、いうことを明瞭に答えた。いたるんですね。はい。正義。正
military personnel and the music educators influenced each other in the context of national defense in the late 1930s and the early 1940s. Then we will move on to the, the last section, the state, state's false assurance. School children developed their ears not only through piano sounds, but also through actual war machine sound, as we just he heard about the military training. Explosive sound training or bakuon kyoiku was a more advanced kind of oral training in wartime that expected listeners to memorize and identify various recorded explosive sounds or bakuon of military aircraft. In 1943, acoustic engineer Taguchi Ryuzaburo, who had concerns about Japanese national security, wrote, quote, we should not just wait and to see those children who are currently taking oral training at national people's schools grow up. It is recommended that people use recordings of actual explosive sounds in order to be able to memorize these war sounds and distinguish one type from another, end quote. During the Pacific War, 1941 to 1945, companies like Nichiku, which was renamed Nippon Columbia in 1946, made recordings of U.S. aircraft sound available in Japan. In April 1943, Nichiku compiled recordings of various U.S. aircraft sound in Tekiki Bakuonshu, meaning a collection of explosive sounds of enemy aircraft. The collection featured aircraft such as the Curtis P-40, the Lockheed Hudson, and the Boeing B-17D, flying at altitude of 1,000, 3,000, and 5,000 meters. It included audio recordings of aircraft dis dis descriptions, which Chiba Air Defense School, or Rikugun Boku Gakko, arranged and supervised. After the Imperial Japanese Army captured these types of aircraft from U.S. forces, pilots at Chiba Air Defense School flew them at different altitudes and recorded these sounds at Chofu Airfield in Tokyo. So I have, I have a recording, one recording example to listen. This is now preserved by National Diet Library. Boeing B-17D Ford 1000m Boeing B-17D Ford 1000 meters. Now, three seconds. This is like the problem of Boeing B-17.
So these recordings were ultimately distributed to national people's schools to integrate into their oral training courses. Chiba Air Defense School was founded in August 1938, quote, under the nece necessity of advancing homeland defense, end quote. It contributed to the spread of oral education and the air defense practices across the nation. An Asahi Shinbun article from August 15, 1941, titled, Fushu ni sonaeru no onkan kyoiku, meaning oral training for female students preparing for air raid, described a demonstration of perfect pitch training for 20 female students by an instructor at Chiba Air Defense School. Such events aimed to educate the public on how to listen for enemy aircraft and detect whether or not they were approaching. In his 1943 Fushigina Otono Sekai, Taguchi offered an analytical framework for listening to the various characteristic explosive sounds or background of military aircraft, including one, exhaust sound or high key on, two, proper sound, two, ah, sorry, propeller sound, propeller on, three, cylinder sound or kito on, and four, sounds generated from a plane, kitai on. If an aircraft is flying, flying at low altitude, all these sounds are audible from the ground according to Taguchi. But at an altitude of 1,000 meters or higher, only its exhaust and the propeller sounds are audible. At an altitude of 3,000 meters or higher, only propeller sounds are audible. And at 6,000 or more meters, even propeller sounds are nearly inaudible. Shigina Otono Sekai aimed, for instance, to help listeners distinguish between exhaust sound, which are essentially rhythmic, and propeller sounds, which by contrast are pitched and have various tone qualities. Again, according to Taguchi. Oral training in Japan, however, had its critics. In November 1940, music critic Kanetsune Kiyosuke contributed a series of essays on oral training titled Onkan Kyoiku no Oto, meaning the sound of oral training, to Asahi Shimbun. Kanetsune questioned whether trainees could really acquire oral skills that were useful in wartime, given that the pitch differences between mortar sound for example, were clearly smaller than between the semitones of the Western piano, the half, half note of the piano. Moreover, how effective could the piano be in oral training when the piano tone's quality is far from that of an aircraft? Not to mention the fact that different types of aircraft have different timbres or tone qualities. Following similar reasoning, physicist Obata Juichi likewise questioned whether the National People's Schools Oral Training Program directly helped children develop the capacity to identify and distinguish the complex variations in wartime aircraft. In a 2005 interview by NHK or Japan Broadcasting Corporation, composer Hattori Koichi recounted his experience of explosive sound training at the National People's School attached to Yamagata Normal School. Quote, my school was attached to a normal school, so it took the lead in trying out such a new oral training curriculum before other elementary schools. We listened to the sounds of the Boeing P-29 Super Fortress, Grumman's aircraft, and other fighters we were then asked to identify these characteristics and the differences. 
But I now realize that the curriculum was absolute nonsense. These criticisms are meaningful today, not only because the oral training program in wartime Japan failed, but also because acoustic locators became outdated. Toward the end of World War II, Japan increasingly replaced locators with radar technologies. The most sophisticated radar at that time could accurately detect the number of enemy aircraft approaching, as well as their altitude, azimuth, and the speed with a level of precision that acoustic locators could not match. This particular story of acoustic defense is both historically and historiographically significant as it involves civilians and, and their defense efforts during world wars. Historian Aaron William Moore has studied, studied how the audibility of bombing in the air raid became part of civilians' wartime experience in Britain, Japan, and elsewhere. Moore draws on auditory perception to capture what it was like to live during war. He writes that, quote, the light sounds and the general spectacle of mass bombing were morbidly fascinating to city people, end quote. They perceived sounds of aerial bombardment rather possibly. In contrast, as my study shows, Japanese children were encouraged to listen actively to the explosive sound of military aircraft ultimately to defend themselves and their nation. By the end of the Pacific War, however, U.S. bombers had destroyed about 43% of the densely populated areas of 66 Japanese cities. On March 9 and 10, 1945, in particular, 279 B-29s firebombed the Tokyo area, killing an estimated 100,000 people. Nearly 1,400 primary schools across the country were either damaged or destroyed. Ultimately, Japanese civil defense techniques, like extinguishing firebombs with water and sound and wearing gas masks and steel helmets hardly helped mitigate the devastation of aerial bombardment. Indeed, in 1947, two years after the end of the World War, the, war, the United States Strategic Bombing Survey reported on the weakness of Japan's civilian air defense, stating that Aside from the psychological effect, those earlier air defense drills and exercises were, quote, probably, probably of little value, end quote. Although not mentioned in the report, oral training as a civil defense endeavor were measured against the sheer scale of wartime death and the ruin incurred by Japan and its people merits critical attention as an example of the state offering its citizens false assurances. Moreover, the undertaking normalized the mobilization of children into a system of total war, forcing them to attune both physically and emotionally to potential hazards in the form of explosive sound. In conclusion, during World War I, as aircraft became new weapons of aerial assault, people increasingly recognized listening as an important human capacity for wartime national defense. Europe and North America employed audio-based military technologies, particularly acoustic locators, giving light to the story of acoustic defense. Japan became a part of this global, global story beginning the 1930s with its own acoustic locators. 
Japanese popular magazines, journals, air defense textbooks, and other publications featured these military machines. My study adds a new dimension to the history of wartime sound politics by examining Japan's national defense efforts to develop oral skills, not just among military personnel, but also among ordinary citizens. Even school children followed an oral training program at National People's Schools to learn to distinguish the sonic characteristics of military aircraft. Chiba Air Defense School attempted to educate the general public on how to listen to enemy aircraft, compiling recordings of U.S. aircraft sounds with the company Nichiku. Shaping this national defense story are the interactions between military academies, bureaucrats, scientists, journalists, progressive music educators, civilians, and the school children in the 1930s and the early 1940s. Hence, the recent discussion of the story of acoustic defense can benefit from developing a much broader historiographical framework. One focus not just on the military context in order to offer a fuller and more nuanced understanding of how modern sound politics overlapped with exercising wartime power. Oral training in early 1940s Japan merits attention as the Japanese state at the time provided its citizens with false assurance. Critical voices, especially physicists like Obata Juichi and the music critics like Kanetsune Kiyosuke rejected the tendency to oversimplify the complexity of war machine sounds. Civil air defense mobilization ultimately failed to prevent the decimation it sought to mitigate. C cities were ruined and hundreds of thousands of Japanese civilians died. Survivors of the war, like Okamoto Nobuko, whom I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, were permanently traumatized by the sound of military aircraft, shedding light especially on the darker side of the story. Mass destruction, ruin, failure, and the residual trauma offers a fuller picture of society's audible past. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Yamada, for that super stimulating talk. Uh, so at this point, we'll turn to the question and answer portion of our lecture. So um, for um, folks in the room and here in Wiser 110, um, we have our uh, wonderful staff person, Yuri Fukuzawa, who has a mic, but there's also, you'll notice these little uh, discs um, uh, at your tables. You can just touch those and speak into the mic there if you'd like to speak that way. Also, um, for our Zoom attendees, uh, please feel free to use the Q&A function via Zoom to submit any questions that you might have for Dr. Yamada, and we'll make sure to include those in the Q&A as well. So, and I'll, I'll ask um, if there are students in the audience or that would like to, to kind of get in on this, um, we try to prioritize you, but other folks are obviously welcome to ask questions as well. Yeah, thank you very much for stimulating the talk. Uh, I learned a lot from you and how, you know, wartime emergency music education intricately, you know, uh, intervened. My question is how and what extent did pre-war music uh, educator or a musician involved with this, uh, you know, uh, education. And uh, if they involve what's happened uh, in a post-war period, is that any, anything any penalized like a Fujita Tsuguharu have, was uh, ostracized from the art circle, eventually is uh, moving to Paris. So that's my mm -hmm. question. Thank you so much, Sonia Sensei. <coughs> so I think the important point is that uh, some music educators began like public speech training started for to the same purpose as the shoka education. So 
they first wanted to cultivate their morals. Yeah. Then there is a, like a conflict between like music educators, then other popular music. Yeah. So these educators don't want let other music in the school district because they are really harmful to students' moral. Yeah. So then how, you know, this purpose was also done by the development of Shoka education in Izawa Shuji. Is a went to Boston, then to develop the Shoka program, Shoka or school song, like a volumes already in the mid 19th century, towards the end, end of the 20th, uh, 19th century. Yeah. But the public speech education is very interesting for me because the first they developed music educators developed for the same purpose, the developing the development of um, children's morality value. However, during the the time of the like, total war, you know, the state encouraged educators or others to participate in the, the national defense. Then this kind of, the, the purpose was changed rapidly, yeah, into the, the more like, practical training for the, so, and also toward the late 1930s, the more like interactions between military personnel and the music educators you know, to develop how I think music educators was thinking about at the time, late, uh, like during the 1930s, how their program or how their new curriculum become contribute to the nation. Yeah. Then they, then one music educator I mentioned at length traveled across the world, then com communicated with Japanese military personnel. Then they realized that the perfect pitch program, but exactly the military personnel in the West, like France, for example, were doing the military personnel in France are already doing the aura training. Exactly what the, those Japanese educators want to cultivate in the school. Yeah. So then those educators find that uh, really meaningful. Yeah. Then after the war, the perfect pitch still remains. The idea of perfect pitch still remains because, you know, many you know, music, mu musicians are some like uh, music musicians are trying to cultivate their perfect pitch. Yeah. Especially when you want to go to a music conservatory and you know, classic music. So I think there is the, the same kind of training, but under the different historical circumstances, the purpose is really changing. Yeah. Then the, then, then music educators were also influenced by the social circumstances. You know. Thank you. Um, we have a question here. Yeah, please. Yes. There we go. You know, if the Japanese networked multiple listening posts together so then they could triangulate where planes were coming in from a certain area because they had phone lines mm -hmm. and they could take listening posts and network them together at the time in the 30s. Uh, so the, I was reading, so the strategy, how the the air yeah, the locator was used actually operated then networking from other yeah I think networking is happening I think then what I learned is that in the 1930s that they published how to operate the acoustic locators itself just one acoustic locator then it involved about like a ten personnel one is listening uh, one is listening the altitude. Then other, other operators listening animals. Then the other, like, uh, other people is collecting the data. Yeah. Then calculating what should we, what should they do? And also it is really attached with satellites and the anti aircraft guns. So satellite and guns and the or acoustic locator. So you see the main various, you know, Perceptions are used, senses are used, listening and uh, seeing in the dark. Yeah. Thanks. And I had one more question, and that is 
did the Japanese consider using animals with ultrasonic hearing like uh, dogs uh, to detect ultrasonics? I have no stimulus. I, okay. I, ha I haven't seen at the time. Thank you. They talked about BAT, B A T, the hearing or sensing sound. I have seen Taguchi Ryu Zabro. Yeah, I remember Taguchi Ryu Zabro I talked about at the beginning of the presentation. I remember he talked about but yeah, Komori, about it. its uh, hear, hearing ability. Yeah, so I think, yeah, they are, sh should have a connection. Yeah, some, especially at the the theoretical level. Yeah, but pra for the practical level, I'm not sure. Yeah, but theorists are really mentioning other human, uh, other, other like non-human beings, yeah, which, yeah, very interesting for me. Thank you. Well, we have a question over here, Matthias. Yeah. So thank you for your talk. Um, I was wondering if you knew if the, like in within Japan, especially in the larger cities, if they had, in addition to like firefighting and auditory, if they had like air raid sirens or like safe spaces, like say, uh, I know in like London during the blitz, they would like go into the subways. Uh -huh. uh, did they have that sort of system in place in Japan? So the in general, the the Japans were learning air defense from Britain and Germany and the United States. The I mentioned uh, history on Sheldon Garon's article published in May. 2020 about the tra destruction, transnational destruction of cities, in which he mentioned really Japan really learned from the enemies, Britain and the United States and Germany. So the learning of the like, strategy, learning strategy, learning like a defense strategy are really transnational. Yeah. So, yeah. I think, I think they learned, they should have learned many things from other countries, including Britain and other Western powers. Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah, please, more. Thank you so much for your talk. It was really interesting. I had um, one comment and then one question. Uh, so earlier, I think it was in the first part of your talk, it was uh, an excerpt describing the children's uh, perfect pitch training. Um, and then there was an expression used uh, that such ears would be useful. And I thought that was really uh, interesting that stood out to me that like such children who have that training or such mm -hmm. skills or training would be useful, but such ears mm -hmm. would be useful to sort of like uh, essentializing people down to a body part um, was really striking to me. Um, so I just wanted to comment on that. Um, and then my uh, question, uh, so your presentation today did focus on like listening as uh, a tool or strategy for defense, uh, but I was curious if uh, sound, either producing sound or controlling or limiting sound could be used as defense or even as offense. I, I do admit that I'm really ignorant of military strategy and technology, but I was wondering during this time mm -hmm. uh, or in Japan, if producing sound or controlling sound was also part of military strategy. I think this is very interesting point. So controlling sound. So to, given that children are training their ears to hear. One important point okay. is, they attended to machine sound to see their conditions. Then the purpose was that to fix if something, the sound of machine is something wrong, they are encouraged to fix, to, to identify the problems in their own machines. Yeah, the ears were supposed to use, to be used. Yeah, so this is one aspect. So attend really not really attending, not not just attending to 
enemy aircraft sound, but also attending to their machine sound. Yeah. yeah so this is, I think, one aspect. Then the really interesting point is how the gender differences, I think, one is because in the military academies, people went to Navy, then they listened. So underwater listening was much more effective than air. Then navies, uh, men listened a lot of underwater water, underwater sound. Yeah. As I played in the recordings, then my, the another like uh, example is you know, woman, high school woman listen to, you know, air sound. So if I want, I, if I do more deeply into this is, I'm really interested in about gender aspect, how different genders then listen to different, differently. Yeah. Thank you. Other questions? Yeah, please. Were there any instances where maybe a child or a woman was shockingly good at this and maybe they like inscripted them into actual use in the war? Or were there like really no cases where someone was very, very good at this? Mm -hmm. Thank you. So it's very interesting is that the time period is really short from 1941 to 1940. Like three or four, yeah. Then only main, main majority of the article I look at is the about policy they want to hear, yeah. rather than actual practice happening in the side. Yeah. Then I haven't done that. However, the military personnel were aware of that, aware that children should start their year training as early as possible so that they can cultivate their perfect pitch. Then after that, one leading mentioned that they want to replace acoustic locator with human ears because acoustic locator is not really movable <laughs> and they're involving many persons to operate. The very hard complex processes. In that case, human ears are more, much more efficient for them. So this is what I, I read from one specific example. Yeah. But the time was really short. So I, I haven't seen specific example like that. No. I think this is very interesting point because there is much Many people talk about uh, their strategies and the plans and what they want to, but it's very few examples about talking about pra practice. Yeah. Thank you. Sure, please. Yeah. Thank you for such an interesting talk. Um, you opened with the sort of recollection, recollection of someone's experience with sound in a very traumatic sense. I was curious if this perfect pitch program maybe also helped like desensitize children to these potentially like scary sounds yeah. or military personnel and if it kind of would help like mitigate panic or just if you could speak to a little bit like how maybe sound can be traumatic in some spaces but like mm -hmm. practical in others. I was just very interested by yeah. that. So to understand that there is, well, I only heard like a uh, wartime experiences. So people who experienced the war speak about sound, wartime sound today, these days. Then, so the, letter, the final part of this, so this is one like book chapter. Then the, the last part of the book, chapter talks about the Okinawa, then their, their experience. So many people experience. So some people, so there is the, 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 so US 
still exist there. There are many people talk, talks this as a backbone of aircraft. So still backbone, the word backbone is used today. Then I look at the city, like Ginoan City's uh, website. Then they collect complaints from people living nearby, so those people living around here. Then some of them were uh, experienced the war. Then it really traumatized by listening to the war, listening to war sound. For instance, yeah, they are not really about the intensity of sound itself as a so on or noise. Yeah. But also this really make them, you know, remember the painful experience, especially in Okinawa in the context. Yeah. So it's people I heard is more talking about how they are traumatized. Yeah. Rather than they are you know, not neutralized or about sound. Yeah. So more like a painful example. Then it's really interesting is that this is today the government at the government level talked about this as a noise pollution as part of environmental history. Then my argument is that by looking at the genealogy of background, it's more than that. It's more than environmental issue. Yeah. More people are traumatized. Yeah. Then once they hear the background of US military aircraft like here, then they remember the pain. So this is part of my talk. Yeah. Uh, part of it. Thank you. We have, oh, sure. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for uh, such an uh, impressive presentation. So uh, I have uh, one question and uh, take, uh, the one comment related to the first question. And, uh, the question is uh, the, uh, about uh, how about uh, other media for public sound uh, education in wartime Japan, uh, especially outside of the school systems. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, uh, radio broadcasting programs mm -hmm. uh, in that time. Uh, the second comment is uh, rated the first one. Um, your presentation um, Mm, reminded me of uh, expositions, uh, wartime exposition, mm -hmm. uh, national defense exposition in that time. So uh, the several uh, wartime uh, no, uh, national defense exposition, Kokubo Dai mm -hmm. uh held uh, here and there in that time in Japan. And uh, uh, the uh, every uh, exposition has a, a various kind of exhibit mm -hmm. or event uh, or program about uh, how to defense from uh, air strikes uh, by the United States. Uh, um, so uh, I have no uh, details about mm -hmm. that, but uh, if you check the uh, programs mm -hmm. of brochures mm -hmm. and uh, uh, National Diet Library, uh, you might find uh, some mm -hmm. new information, I think. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Thank you very much, Hasegawa-sensei. Uh, so the question of the media, so the media is really controlled by the government, especially the Pacific War from like 1941 and so on. And, uh, the, the media is really about related with sound is how military personnel are train, training by hearing the, the sound. Another example is that I didn't show from here, but one is a, there's an NHK archives hub in which like a Navy is train, training who are training, like uh, the children training in the, at the academy is listening underwater sound. And also memorizing different types of submarines 
by creating a chart, then using like a Western hybrid notation, for instance, like a submarine A has the pitch ranges of from C to like A or something like that, then it typically creates the tri triple rhythm. Then, then, then there was a song based in, intended to memorize that chart. Then this try to sing the song to memorize, to memorize the different characteristics of the wartime song. So this was one, the military, mainly military. And also I think another is a gunka or some other music, yeah, military songs, yeah. Yeah. Thank you for, for that. We have um, we have one comment from from online. I just wanted to share with you, uh, KSK. This is from Harriet Morris, who says, uh, "Thank you for such an interesting talk." As a post-war music education music education note, uh, University of Michigan Libraries holds a 1947 typescript of a Mombusho draft for public school curricula submitted for occupation censors. Uh, the the title is "Gist of Teaching Music." Uh, an archival photocopy is at Hatcher, and it's quite fascinating. Okay. So maybe you're already aware of this, but she's very kind of kindly okay. kind of giving you more, uh -huh. more, um, more resources for your for, okay. your for your project. So, um, and I I have a question or kind of comment class question, and then I think we can close up. But uh, really appreciated your talk, and it's really rich. And I I was really struck by what you ended with um, in terms of thinking about Okinawa, and I know that you're working on projects related to sustainability and environmentalism, and I guess. I um, there was a moment when you were talking about uh, a little bit about gender, but also I was wondering a little bit about um, you know what types of music education produce what types of communities. So in terms of things about um, so you mentioned the Navy kind of context and how that's gendered, but also what types of of ears or what types of training are producing what types of communities. I'm thinking about homosociality first of all, but also what types in the context of Okinawa, mm -hmm. what types of populations are seen as being um, disposable or um, more kind of uh, willing to or more ripe for noise pollution or something like that? Is there a way in which trying to think about your the work that you've done around mm -hmm. kind of racism on the one hand, but also sustainability and environmentalism mm -hmm. and how the state um, um, is ascribing a certain value or lack of value to certain populations in terms of how much say noise pollution or how much trauma or you know they can mm -hmm. they can actually absorb mm -hmm. particularly as it relates to something like mm -hmm. the kind of so-called mainland japan mm -hmm. um, and versus okinawa mm -hmm. and how that relates to some of your, your larger questions around mm -hmm. environmentalism as it relates to music mm -hmm. study. thank you Jackson. yeah so i think different communities in terms of different communities yeah this is yeah i'm really interested in about First, particularly about gender, different by gender, as I showed the example in the woman is uh, listening to the the aircraft sound, you know, and uh, led by a teacher at the Chiba Air Defense School. Then, particularly, this committee was basically created uh, locals and also the gender based on gender. So I would like to more look into that aspect. However, the lack of sources people are talking about, which really excites me about doing this is really as a history, like a history and challenge <laughs> to how big. So there is a many like a uh, sources, primary sources talking about the context. Then, if you want to look at certain practice, there's no really one or two, if there is, if any, you know, sources, then you, you want to narrate that, that kind of practice. Yeah. Then based on gender and other identities. Yeah. So I think what I do is like collecting different materials. Yeah. Sources. Then. If I have any things, when one gender is one thing, you know, one, one idea excited me, <laughs> yeah, recently, why, where I looking at, yeah. And the local differences as well. And uh, maybe 
I think different people listen to different differently. And the largest cities, you had a, you had a, you experienced many like aircraft sounds. So yeah, I think more, I think it's, yeah, for me, it's good to look up the overall experiences. And also in terms of Okinawa, it's very different. People have different types of listening. Even look, just looking at complaints published, like anonymous complaints published, like many hundreds of complaints. The city collected hundreds, I think thousands of great yeah, complaints. One is really listening to carefully using like a mass, like a detector or like a measuring, noise measure, measuring instrument. Then, then really reporting exactly the air, the like sound of certain military aircraft, like a sound that like uh, more than 100 decibel or something like that. The sound was like uh, Osprey and the sound was different. So I found besides their complaining, like uh, environmental aspect and also the trauma, what I found is that some people are really listening to listening carefully to different <laughs> US military aircraft sound. They can differentiate one from another. Other. Yeah. So this is what I Great. Thank you so much. Well, this is all the time we have for today. Um, please join me again in thanking Professor uh, Yamada for his really super interesting talk. Thank you. Thank you very much.